Antiquae Femae Custos. Gardens of Ancient Renown. HMS Renown, the Royal Navy's most underrated dreadnought, most underrated vessel in service. She served in World War One and World War Two. One of the great things about her is when she's being designed, when she's being conceived, it's basically cancel free R class battleships build to R class battle cruisers using some of the components procured from them. Lord Fisher turns around, and with the other HMS Renown of the Key Ship series, the HMS Renown of 1895, Key Ship Series 1, Ship 10. Well, using that vessel as a template for saying what he wanted, and in, including so far as to say, look, that bow, I want the same bow. It's got to be bigger, but I want the same bow. He once again built a ship called Renown that was to fulfill his vision. It's kind of an interesting scenario, that is, because that means you can point to her more than you can point to almost any other ship. Again, as going, what is Jackie Fisher's vision of a battle cruiser? Why do I say that? Because as much as you can point to the Invincibles and go, well, you know, look, look, them. Surely he, he gets his vision with them. He doesn't really. And when I say that, he doesn't really. It's because of the lessons learned and the insistence on to try and get that forward firing six guns. They have the shape they do. They have the sh layout of guns that they do. And that causes the vessel to be beamier than it needs to be for its size. Which means it can't be as efficient cutting through the water as he wants it to be. Next class of Valor Cruisers, he gets to so build. Other renowns. This is a ship which, whilst in World War One, it doesn't get to do much because the Battle of Jutland has finished off most operations in the North Sea in terms of involving large ships. For World War One. In World War Two, she hunts the Grass Bay. She takes part in Norway. She hunts the Bismarck. She works with Force H at Gibraltar. She takes part in the Battle of Cape Spar de Vento. She does Arctic convoys, Operation Torch. She serves in the Eastern Fleet. She takes part in attacks on Japanese occupied facilities in Indonesia. She has a massively expansive career. And when built, when first built, she is the fastest capital ship in the world. Thirty two knots. That's enough speed for her to be able to dictate battle to anything else in her time period. There is nothing around that can match it at the time of her completion. And she does this all using 42 boilers. 42 boilers. Think about the difficulty of making that all work. Think about what 42 boilers, it's difficult enough on these ships with just a couple of boilers. Comparatively. 42? One of the interesting things though about them is that HMS Renown's 
whole design, her whole structure, her speed is made possible by the fact that she uses Brown Curtis direct drive steam turbines. It becomes really an odd thing because the designs chosen by the German Navy for most of their turbines up until the Mackensons are Parsons. For their battle cruisers. And for the Royal Navy, Parsons had been a bit of a preferred version as well. But Brown, especially after their link up with Curtis, had started to produce some really, really good designs. And renown and repulse benefit from this. They get the Brown Curtis steam turbines. And that is how they get the 112,000 shaft horsepower necessary to allow them to attain 32 knots. On paper. In reality, it was found on trials that she generated 126,000 shaft horsepower and could reach 32.5 knots. She would normally go to sea with roughly 1,000 tons of fuel but could carry a maximum capacity of roughly 4,300 tonnes of fuel. At that capacity, she could steam at a speed of 18 knots for 4,000 nautical miles. Burning a tonne of fuel a mile. For those who are used to these things being given in a, a different frame of reference, that's 288.7 gallons per mile. Roughly. <laughs> Just imagine that next time you're going to the petrol station or gas station, depending on where you are, and you're filling up your car. Imagine it was burning that much. 288.7 gallons per mile. Now, this is the other point which should come out when people start going, well, you know, you don't need the smaller ships or you don't need the other ships when you have the big ships. Yeah, but you want to move a big ship through water and power all the systems it needs to have for it to do its role in wartime, in peacetime, that's going to be very expensive. You might want to look at that smaller ship, because if you don't need to send the big ship, economically you might not want to. As beautiful as the big ship is, and let's be honest, she does look beautiful. These were now the keys to the Royal Navy's power. They were the keys to the world. One of the things which is often forgotten when we're talking about battle cruisers and the Royal Navy is we fit, put them for a prism of World War One or World War Two, and those are perfectly good prisms. I'd say one does far better. The Royal Navy battle cruisers, when they're used as they're supposed to be in World War One, they do fine. When they use as they're supposed to be in World War Two, they do fine. When they are used inappropriately for how the Royal Navy designs them, they run into trouble. Let me explain this. German battle cruisers, by default, are designed to be slightly more suitable for fighting the battle line. Why? Because despite Tirpitz's objections, the Kaiser understood. And this is one of the few times you will hear me saying something good about Kaiser Wilhelm. So mark this day when it comes out. Kaiser Wilhelm included, listened to Hosendorf and understood that they were never going to have enough battleships to do the job they needed to do to fight in the fighting line. So they nicked the idea of the Japanese. They decided they would use some of their cruisers. Their large cruisers would also be able to support the battle line. And the idea was to make it so they would be able to hold long enough against enemy battleships that they could damage the battleships before they were inevitably sunk. And their battleships would be strong enough to survive 
the beating, the other fighting with the other enemy with the enemy battleships, so that they could then roll on and beat up the damaged enemy battleships, which would survive the fight with their cruisers. That's the idea. Okay, it's a brutal idea. Please note, no one wants that to happen. Everyone thinks that they can be smart enough and they can dodge around and they can come up with a new way to solve the issue. But at its base point, that is what putting cruisers in the battle line is doing. The idea is those cruisers will keep those battleships occupied long enough. Those battleships can't double up our, the rest of our battleships, which allows our battleships to win the fight with their battle, the battleships they're fighting and then go and finish off their battle, uh, the battleships which were beating up our, have this probably sunk our cruisers. That is it. German battleship cruisers are designed, therefore, with that in mind. British battle cruisers aren't, because Britain has enough battleships. They don't need them to do that. What do they need them to do? Well, they have this pesky thing called a global empire. It's really rather annoying. It causes so much paperwork and you know, it's, it's given me, it gives us all premature grey hair, all the paperwork. All the paperwork. And this means there are huge amounts of trade lanes which need to be protected. There are huge amounts of, area, of areas which need to have their flag shown. And there are large numbers of problems with people who might not have a battleship. But you still need to turn up in something which is going to completely out out whoop their entire fleet to make sure they get the point that just don't have a fight. Because it's far cheaper to send one of these things at 288.7 gallons per mile than to actually fight a war. This thing turning up, most nations around the world are going to go, huh. Hello, HMS Renown. Uh, you appear to be looking extra lovely today. The light really appreciates you. Yes. And I, I can't help but notice that you have guns which are very big. They're 15 inch guns. And what does a 15 inch gun mean? Well, if I find my little. He says he can find it. I had it over here, but it got buried underneath dog uh, dog um, treats. Fifteen inches. So, if I put this next to my head, so chin up at the fifteen-inch mark. Yeah, that's a pretty big gun, and she's got six of those. Not quite the whole way across me, but um, not far off. And you see, it's a habit. What they do is they, they have these lovely dinner parties uh, hosted in tents where you're right underneath the guns. And you get to dance uh, right underneath the guns. You get to eat right underneath the guns. It's all very subtle, right underneath the guns. That is what the Royal Navy needs battle cruisers for. They also need battle cruisers in wartime to not only do defensive role, although the Royal Navy will never admit this, they are the Royal Navy's surface raider Supremes. They are what will wipe out any trade protection you try to put in place. They are what will make any trade protection you put in place very expensive, because your only option is going to be probably... Okay, we either, if we keep our battle fleet concentrated, we might be able to fight the British battle fleet and turn them off. But then our trade gets hoovered up. Okay, so we need to disperse our battle fleet to defend our trade. So, convoys, each of a battleship with them. Now our battleships are out solo. Our convoys are safe, but oh sugar! The Royal Navy has now a squadron of battleships literally going from convoy to convoy, destroying them. People sometimes try and look for smart, really, you know, hidden, clever ideas behind the fighting of war. No, no, it can be starkly, simply brutal and efficient. 
it really can be. And often the larger the scale you're fighting on, the more starkly brutal and efficient you go for. The question is often, do you present your opponent with problems? Or do you present them with conundrums? That's the phrase usually going around in Britain. There's sometimes other phraseology used. A problem has a solution. A conundrum usually is a scenario where either option is bad. You either have no trade or you have no battle fleet. Your choice. Pick. Now, some nations can survive that. They can survive having no trade. But there aren't many. And there are especially not many in the 1910s and 1920s. And the ones that can mostly aren't really a threat to anyone else. What do I mean by no trade? Well, you see... Here is where things get interesting. Because people usually go, well, you know, it's, if you don't have foreign trade, you can probably survive it. Think about no internal trade. HGVs are relatively recent in terms of goods transport. Hell, even railways are relatively recent in terms of good transport versus the sea and the coastal movement of goods. And that is what these ships were for. They could dash in, dash out, and make it problematic. And they didn't actually need to dash in or dash out to make your life problematic. Because let's say the Royal Navy doesn't send a squadron of battleships in. They don't. Their existence there has meant that you've had to deploy your battle fleet to go and defend those convoys. And the Royal Navy sends in submarines. They're ambush predators. Maybe... Submarines like the T-Class were designed to be, with, you know, ten forward-firing torpedoes, so could fire a maximum spread. And they're just going to wait till... Not, they're not worried about the rest of the convoy, no, no. They're just going to wait till the battleship's in the right position, and then they just launch all their torpedoes at it. Because if they launch ten, enough torpe ten torpedoes at a the correct range, the odds are there's nothing that battleship can do to avoid getting hit, not once, but twice or three times. In which case, the odds are it's sunk. It might survive, in which case it's going to be out of operations for six to eight months, at the minimum, if you can repair it, but it's going to be sunk. It's probably going to be sunk. That happens a few times, you've lost your battle fleet. And the Royal Navy never risked a single battleship in range of your air defences on the shore, or anything like that. In the interwar years, the Royal Navy used their battle cruisers, Tiger, Renown, Repulse, Hood, to sail around the world. As a rule, they are functioning in two pairs. Hood and Repulse used to like to go around. They do a great big tour of the world. So does Renown. She goes around. She has several reconstructions, but Renown has a very specific gift and duty. Her gift is she's used as the royal ship. Yes. This gets her reconstructed a few more times, but she is often used as the royal ship to transport members of the royal family around. And again, that's an added bonus of sending a battle cruiser. It has a lot of space on it. Battle cruisers are big. They have a large amount of engines in their hull. They usually carry their guns forward and aft. They're battleship-grade guns, but they're fore and aft. And there's a lot of space. Because they have all the engines in the hull, they have a lot of deck space. Deck space means equals entertaining space. This is why Renown is used as the flagship of the Battlecruiser Squadron when Hood is refitting between 1929 and 1931. Because she has done things like take the Duke and Duchess of York to Australia between January and July 1927. 
she has done the duties necessary for high status jobs. She actually did collide with Hood in January 1935 when they were exercising off the coast of Spain. Both ships' captains are court-martialed, as is Rear Admiral Sidney Bailey. Um, Hood's captain and Rear Admiral Bailey were acquitted, but Captain Sawbridge was relieved of command. That was according to court-martial. Unfortunately for Bailey, it was not considered necessarily correct, because the Admiralty looked at the court-martial, looked at the verdict, looked at the facts, and said the Admiralty Board dissented the verdict, reinstated Sawbridge and his post, and criticised Bailey for ambiguous signals during the manoeuvre. It's always an interesting scenario to think about. What exactly might have happened from that point, because, well, Bailey was saved. He was saved because of Admiral Chatfield, who he'd served as chief of staff to, uh, char uh, chief of staff to, uh, when he'd been commander in chief of the Mediterranean fleet. He was saved. But he wasn't safe for that long. Bailey mm, ended up being allowed to remain on Hood until she returned to Portsmouth and then was appointed President of the Royal Naval College, Greenwich, in 1937. He was promoted Admiral on retirement in 1939. Yes, the Royal Navy getting rid of Admirals in 1939 when they notice a war coming and there's they're losing a lot of officers through dying, uh, through overwork. There are actual officers they are considering getting rid of. Bailey was actually recalled to active service after the outbreak of the Second World War. Again, this was on the insistence of various people uh, from the Chatfield faction. Remember, the same faction which had put through 14-inch guns for the King George V. And he was put in charge of the Bailey Committee, which was... Created in June 1940 to examine the level of naval assistance to be sought from the United States. The report was handed to uh, Admiral Robert L. Gromley of the USN in August 1940, and Bailey and Gromley met regularly through the autumn and developed uh, processes for the exchange of information about intelligence, technical, and operational matters. Bailey was a very good staff officer. I'm not sure if he should have been necessarily given the battle cruiser squadron. Because whilst he had been captain of HMS Renown at one point, and he had commanded a destroyer flotilla in nineteen twenty three he spent a large chunk of his life even though he served as a gunnery officer and you know, he'd been in the staff of BT, serving as fleet gunnery officer aboard HMS Lion during 1916. He's part of BT's staff. All these things... Uh, he seems to be a very good staff officer in the naval staff and as attaché in Washington and has good connections to the Americans. He seems, though, to have taken after BT in terms of communication technique. And that certainly led to the issues. And whilst some tried, his career was saved, it wasn't saved to have the glory which he'd wanted it to have. It, it's one of those interesting things when you're reading the discussion that's going on. In 1935, in the Admiralty meet minutes, and what the naval officers are not saying about what happened. And that's one of the interesting things. When you're reading a minutes of a meeting, 
And you can tell either there has already been discussions going on in the corridors outside this meeting room before they've gone in that were not going to be minuted. Or that people here are speaking in a subtext because they don't need to fill in the rest. Because they know what should be going on. It makes it very interesting. This was her change. Yeah. And during the interwar period, she does all the work she does, but she also gets a full upgrade. And her full upgrade drops her from 42 boilers to 8 boilers. She still has 120,000 shaft horsepower. Still has 120,000 shaft horsepower. Loses apparently a knot of speed in theory. I say in theory because there are several personnel around the world who were being chased by her at certain points who will claim that she did not lose a knot of speed as far as they were concerned. In fact, might have gained a couple of knots. Her 42 boilers are replaced with eight. She still retains four turbines, brown Curtis ones again. She now has ten twin four and a half inch dual purpose guns. That's from her previous armament, which was five triple and two single four inch guns. And two single three inch guns as her sort of secondary armament. So. She replaces 19 guns, 17 4 inch and, three for, uh, and 2 3 inch, with 20 4 and a half inch. She also gets three octuple 40mm AA guns, that's her uh, pom poms. It's a fairly decent armament. She does lose her torpedo tubes. Her original waterline belt, which had been crump cemented armour, well, that had been between three and six inches thick. This is upgraded to more modern armour as part of this process, and it becomes between three and nine inches thick. So you think again, she's dropped officially not in speed. She's gained an extra secondary gun, and let's be honest, 24 and a half inch versus 17 4 inch and 2 3 inch. That's a heavy up, hefty upgrade in terms of firepower allowance. Her belt armor has been increased by 3 inches in certain places. Her deck armor has gone from 1 to 2 and a half inches to 1, and a, 1, to, one to 5 inches thick. Her bets are still fought between 4 and 7 inches thick. Her gun turrets are 7 to 9 inches thick in terms of their armour. 9 inches at the front, going to 7 at the back. 10 inches on the conning tower. Bulkheads are between 3 and 4 inches thick. Oh, and she's also picked up float planes and an aircraft catapult. She's done all that. She's increased her deep load. From 32,740 tons to 36,660 tons. So, let's be honest, that's about 4,120 tons. At, I don't know. 3,920 tons. Sorry, mass went in the wrong direction. And yet, only officially lost a knot. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to the ultimate glow up in ship world. Because whilst she's lost a knot in speed, officially, and I please note, I am saying this officially, it's like her 32 knots originally was the official top speed. Take top speeds with a pinch of salt from the Royal Navy. They tend to 
they, they, they tend to just design top speed and they design everything conservatively on the speed scenario. So, again, I think it's worthwhile using the Ark Royal, Illustrious, and pretty much all the aircraft carrier and some of the capital ship experience of World War I and World War II to justify the fact that I wouldn't be surprised if there's a two to three knot grace in there somewhere. But leaving that to one side, this ship has got even more powerful and even more capable. And she's used primarily in two roles in World War II. She is used as not just a high status asset, but something like, for example, Force H. She is a constant member of Force H, along with Ark Royal. This is a fast strike group. This is what she's good for. The carrier don't need to slow down with Renan around. The carrier has to keep up. Yes, the carrier can go fast, launch aircraft in the wind. That's good. Renan ain't slowing down, she's zigzagging along. The carrier will keep up with her. She actually first joined Force H as part of the hunt for the Grass Bay. She didn't find the Grass Bay, mainly because it got scuttled before she could get close to it, but she was trying. Uh, but she did manage to track down the SS Watusi, and, well, she sank her. That was a bit of an unfair fight. 15-inch guns versus a virtually unarmed ship. She remains in the South Atlantic even after the Grass Bay is sunk in the 17th of December. She returns to the home fleet in March 1940. At this point, she becomes flagship of the Battlecruiser Squadron. Why? Because Hood has been paid off to refit. Often a forgotten point about Hood. Yes, yeah, she doesn't have a major refit, but she does pay off a refit in 1940. Renown takes over. As such, it's Renown bombing around the Norwegian campaign and bumps into Sean Horsen Neiser now. Yes, the two 11-inch armed German fast battleships. Fast battleships, not battlecruisers. They are battleships. Yes, they have 11-inch guns, but as I've said in many other videos, just because your nation can only build 11-inch guns doesn't mean they're not building a battleship. It just means they're building a battleship which has room for growth later on to be upgraded to 15-inch guns. Now... The Germans actually managed to hit her first. They had already... Wow. That day, uh, one of her destroyers had been sunk by HMS, uh, by Hipper. HMS Glowworm had been sunk by Hipper. And Renown was actually coming, looking for Glowworm, because they worried what happened to her. Glowworm had been one of her escorts. So she runs across the channels and nice now. She fires at them. They fire back. They manage to hit her first. But um, a few minutes later, Neisenau gets hit with 15-inch shell and two 4.5-inch shells that knock out the ship's main fire control director and damage its rangefinder on a turret. Renown has got into 4.5-inch range of them. Okay. She could have hung out at 15 inch range and bombed them, uh, bombed away them, but no, she's winding in that distance and she's got to four and a half inch range. That is not good. To give you an explanation of this, the four and a half inch gun is considered maximum firing range about a little under 19 kilometers. Accurate firing range for engaging targets moving at sea in heavy seas is probably closer to roughly 15 kilometers where they expect to be hitting. The maximum range for a 15-inch gun is 
nearly, well, it's over 30 kilometers. It's very close. It's getting, heading up to, up to 31 kilometers. So, she is therefore at half her 15 inch gun range. And she is well into four and a half inch gun range to be most likely to be scoring hits like she was hitting on Sean Horse and Nice Enough. The German ships managed to be fast and renowned in the heavy weather. Now, this is one, uh, this is a sort of interesting point here. Their speed is also 31 knots officially. And they were going faster than that. They were pushing it at full speed. Which is sensible, but they have 12 water tube boilers with three steam turbines supplying three screw, uh, screw propellers. So they have roughly four boilers per turbine and roughly 150,000 indicated horsepower. Or put another way, and uh, this is some rough analysis. Renown achieves 31 knots officially on 89,000 kilowatts of power generation. Scharnhorst and Neisenau achieve 31 knots officially on 111,717 kilowatts of power generation. So they have 22,717 kilowatts more of generation capacity. They managed to get away, but they had to crack everything on to do so. And the fact is, she'd reeled them in as close as she could, and then they managed to work up speed to get away. And she did reel them in, because she's getting the distance down to roughly 15 kilometers to be scoring consistent four and a half inch air shell hits. They get away. And Renown engaged them for roughly 90 minutes. During that time, she fired 230 rounds from her main guns and over a thousand rounds from her secondary armament during the engagement. She had to go in for repairs to damage to herself as well from the 20th of April to 18th of May and then provided cover during the evacuation of Norway in early June. Now, remember, she'd taken over the battlecruiser squadron for Hood to go into refit. Hood had to come out of refit and gone to serve in Gibraltar as Force H's flagship. At this point, Renown, of course, had another refit. She goes to Force H and takes over the role as flagship so that Hood can come back. And that is the beginning of her war in the Mediterranean. Now, this video is already nearly 40 minutes long, and frankly, it can go longer when I'm talking about Renown. But I have to get all the videos done before I go. I could talk about her involvement in the Battle of Cape Spartavento. I want to do a proper video about that battle, though, someday. So instead... I'd like to talk about when she's transferred home. Because during 1941, she gets her full radar fit, or her first full radar fit. This includes a Type 284 radar for surface gunnery control, if she'd had a gunnery radar when fighting against Neisenau and, Gra uh, Neisenau and Scharnhorst. I'm not sure they'd have managed to get out of that one, considering how accurate her gunnery was without one. 
a Type 285 anti-aircraft gunnery radar, a Type 281 air warning radar, and a Type 271 surface search radar. Importantly, about apart from about the fitting of all these radars, was a lot of work had been done in her previous refit, her major previous major refit, to actually make it viable for her to have radars fitted to her. They'd fitted in power cables and power generation capa capacity to try and improve her chance of being able to take it all. She also gained two quadruple pom-pom mounts on top of the turret. Again, it's nice to have them. She's transferred to the home fleet, as said, and becomes deputy fleet flagship when the Duke of York, as HMS Duke of York, the King George V class battleship, is detached to take Winston Churchill to Arcadia Conference in Washington. As such, she starts to provide inbound and outbound convoy uh, cover to convoys uh, to the Soviet Union in March 1942. She then gets replaced in role by Duke of York and goes on to become flagship of Force W. This was formed of escort carriers carrying fighters to be flown off to Malta in April, May, and so she takes them down. She then goes back and returns and rejoins home fleet. Uh, once more, but is transferred back to Force H in October 1942 to participate in Operation Torch. Her war goes on much like that. I think one of the big shames for her and when I say shame I don't mean as it besmirches her, I think it is used to deride a lot of other ships, is that her sister didn't get the same level refit, didn't they? they managed to fit it in. Because that's why they actually did consider sending Renown with Prince of Wales to the Far East, but she was too useful. Prince of Wales had ongoing issues, so they sent her out there. And Repulse was not upgraded, but had the status and capabilities. If you consider what Repulse managed to do in dodging the attacks coming in on 4C, as I've said before and I'll say again, it's... That scenario, when you look at it, it always reminds me to an extent of a program in the UK called Strictly Come Dancing. And in America, I believe it's called Dancing with the Stars. And it's got various names around the world. But it's this format of you get these celebrities with professional dancers competing. And they're competing in dancing. And almost every year, you seem to get something similar turns up. There's a young sportsman. Nice bloke, probably. Trying his best, but can't dance. But... You know, they are a big, basically very, very fit, very strong-looking, healthy bloke, Man, usually. Usually. Um, this is the usual. It's very rare. It usually works out differently when the partnership's the other way around. But let me explain that. Uh, it's a, that's not scenario. And they will be... They will be paired with a female dancer. Of course. Usually the female dancer will be uh, it's older. You know, they've had more years experience. But they are still stunningly amazing at their job and at dancing. And 4Z, it's almost it always reminds me of this sort of that sort of dance of the guy, especially in the first couple of weeks when they literally are standing there, they're not, not sure what much dancing there. And they're doing Basically, just stand out, going through the motions, going around. And then you have this female dancer twirling all around the place, doing all sorts of tricks and everything to make them look good so they can get them through the first couple of weeks so they can try and get them actually doing something they're going to be good at in the later, in the later shows. But at that point, literally, the entire thing is that is that female dancer twirling around, making them look good. Their purpose is to stand there and be in the right position when the female dancer needs them to be there. And if we look at how Repulse, etc., is manoeuvring to avoid the attacks coming in, she's dancing all over the place. And when you listen to the talks of air attacks on Renown, she's also dancing all over the place. 
And if you think about it, if you go through Renown's history and the air attacks on her and the damage they did do versus they didn't do, you soon get the idea that if Repulse had managed to have the same upgrades as Renown, then they would have been pound for pound two of the most vital ships for the Royal Navy in World War II. Because plus for, uh, over 30 knots of speed, decent, uh, decent 15 inch guns, okay, only six of them, but still, it's going to max in against the Scharnhorst with its 9 11 inch guns, or even if it got upgraded, 6 15 inch guns, and able to do a lot of long range work and also defend themselves and maneuver well. This design, it's thrown together so much, you know. It's basically Fisher returning as first Sea Lord, pushing through his ideas and building a Dreadnought version of his previous renown, his previous baby, and getting Eustace Denicott to turn into reality. He wanted the ships to have been delivered in 15 months. He wanted them delivered in 15 months. And if you think about that, if as they were laid down in January 1915, if they had been delivered within 15 months, they're launched in March 1916, which is 16 months, basically. Almost. Well, no, 25th January to 1st. They're launched within 15 months. And then they're commissioned September 1916. But if they had been done in 15 months, or even 16 months, starting in January 1915, if it had if been 15 months, They could well have been in service about the same point, if not earlier, than Royal Sovereign and worked up. And as we all know, they would have been part of the Battle Cruiser fleet, which means with their 15 inch guns, BT would have been aboard them, going, I've got the newest, coolest ship ever. And they would have been at Jutland. And that could have been interesting. That could have been interesting. Would that change our view of battle cruisers? I doubt it, but the extra 15 inch guns and the fire control that they were fitted with uh, would have certainly made for some interesting scenarios for the German fleet and the battle, their scouting, their scouting group, first scouting group in Jutland, because as it was. Even if a 15 inch shell didn't go off properly, and some did, some didn't, there were issues with them. There were issues with British shells all over that day. And a 15 inch shell, a shell itself hitting you causes a significant amount of damage. It's a fairly hefty emotional event. Some might even call it a significant emotional event, but I'll call it a hefty emotional event because I think significant doesn't carry the same weight. So, Major must renown. A good ship. Now, one of the reasons, one of the interesting things that did happen though, and I did see this in some of the designs, was that uh, they considered, with these ones, actually building with triple turrets. But they decided to reuse the second, uh, the twin turrets that they were using from the R class battleships because that would make it cheaper to deliver. Again, this is a constant theme in Fisher's construction. He's so obsessed with getting things set into service quickly. He sometimes doesn't take sort of the opportunity because it, I think if they had been triple 15-inch gun ships and had nine 15-inch guns, A, goodness knows what happens with Hood. But also you have... You'd have had to ask yourself, really, why the Royal Navy would have spent any money on something like Royal Oak and doing the upgrade and refit they did to her of the R-Class when they could have upgraded, used that same money and effort and time to upgrade Repulse. If they've got nine 15-inch guns.
And that's going to be today's question, because I am doing a lot of research in that moment on, into the triple turret conundrum, and it's one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to going to Australia, because I'm hoping to do a little bit of research, because I've heard some papers might have managed to make them or make their way out there, because of the design selection of HMAS Sydney. And as a result, I'm well, HMAS Australia and HMAS Sydney. So, uh, because as a result of that, I'm looking forward to getting to grips with those archives. This comes out after I've hopefully visited those archives, and I hope you enjoyed it. But as it is, I'm therefore going to make today's question a triple turret themed question. Renown and Repulse are built with triple turrets. In scenario A, they are completed before Jutland and therefore take part in Jutland. What do you think happens? Does this change anything? Scenario B, they're completed after Jutland. How do you think this affects their interwar period service? How do you think this affects their upgrade plans? Do you think they get upgraded in the interwar period and both of them have these lovely, lovely four and a half inch gun fits? I mean, that's just, that's just lovely. You know. Yeah, let's have five twin turrets each side with four and a half inch guns on. Just we're getting the 15 kilometers range of Shan Horse nicer now, and we'll make them really understand what close range is. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and take care.